Shalom, shalom, everyone. Uh, my name is Alyssa Platkow. I'm the new fellow. I'm so excited to be here with you and to go over some themes of Rosh Hashanah today, or and Yom Kippur actually. Today we are specifically going to go through the additions in the Shacharit Amidah. Um, we and we'll go through all of the major additions. I think we're just skipping one. Um, and if you wanna, if you wanna speak to me about that one, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk to you about that later. I'm gonna just share my screen and then we will begin. Okay, so what's different about the high holidays? There are so many differences and we're just gonna narrow it down to the differences that we see specifically in the, um, in the Amidah. And I'm gonna ask for readers throughout. So if you wanna raise your hand, if you wanna read at any point, that would be great. Okay, so we start off and if you have a, if you have your machsor, if you have your lev shalem, I'm starting off on page 81. If you want to take a moment to grab it, that's fine too. We'll give you a second. And I've included for everyone who doesn't have a machsor, I've included all of the pieces that we're going to talk about, but the machsor will give you what's before the piece and what's after the piece. And I'll say that too but uh, having the visual can be helpful for some people. Okay, we'll just wait one more second for people to return. Yes. And I will also put the link in the chat. Okay. Okay. All right, I see most people have returned, so we're gonna start. So you'll see on page 81 um, and and even you can you can uh, run through it in your mind. We're in the Amidah. We're doing the Avot v'Imahot. Uh, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rebecca, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. And then we have this new paragraph, this Misod paragraph. So in the Hebrew, Misod Chachamim Unvonim. Umilemed dat mivinim, eftecha fi bitfila uvtachanunim, lechalot ulchanen pene melech malche hamlachim, ve adone ha adonim. And you might recognize it with, with, uh, vadone ha adonim, right? We're coming, we're coming into the, into the spirit just with that melody line of the high holidays. Okay, could I get a reader on, the uh, English, please. And P and if you're interested in reading it all throughout the um, throughout the session, you can just keep your hand raised, and I'll move throughout. Okay, no takers, I suppose. Up, oh. all right, Sonia. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Um, so should I read the bold print as well? Uh, just the just the um, normal print here, starting with drawing from. Drawing from the counsel of the wise and the knowing, from the teachings born of insight among those who understand, I open my mouth now in prayer and pleading to implore and to plead before the king, king of kings, 
and Lord of Lords. Okay, so what initially what what initially stands out to anyone? Sonia, you can have first dip since you're already uh, unmuted. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 pretty humble. It's pretty ready and open. The word is there's a word open there, and it's um, you know it's historically uh, oriented. So and. and um, well, it's drawing up from the council, but from teachings born from insight, there's a sense of an historical, um, what's to say, um, you know, uh, appreciation, um, gratitude, and there's an emphasis on on the wisdom. You know, it's in our prayers all the time, the, the wisdom, the knowing. <laughs> totally, totally. And I'm glad, and I'm glad that you, um, specifically drew on this kind of gratitude from the counsel of the wise and the wisdom that's out there because understand right because this piece serves two purposes so the first purpose is a reshoot is a permission this is the shaliach sibor the shlichat sibor asking for permission to represent the kahal in prayer before God. And it's almost like um, Hinani is coming through here too. So we don't do Hinani in the in the morning. We only do it in the in Musaf. We don't do it in Shacharit, only in Musaf. Um, but it's almost as if we have this little piece of Hinani built into the Amida. My mouth is open in prayer and I'm pleading. This is a moment of yearning. And then on top of it, the second purpose is that it's a subtle assurance. So these first two lines drawing from the counsel of the wise and the knowing uh, from the teachings born of insight among those who understand that line is there almost as a framing to say what you're about to hear is not just the normal uh, Shabbat Amida. This is an Amida that has PU team throughout it. We have like seven PU team just in the Shacharit one alone. Um, and a PU is a liturgical poem written uh, anywhere from temple times all the way to today. And it's often put to song, but sometimes it's it's just read uh, quietly. But so so in the repetition of the Amida specifically. The, the Shlichat Sibor is representing all these people. And she says, I want to make sure that you know that I'm going to throw in these extra PU team, these extra liturgical poems. And the reason why she says this is because in the 13th century, there was a lot of debate about whether or not PU team should be included in the Matbea. And in fact, um, Sadia Gaon and Maimonides, uh, two of our two of our big commentators, two people who have really uh, formed Judaism, molded Judaism as we know it today, they are both on record talking about how unnecessary uh, PU team are and how some of them have pro problematic uh, theology and some of them um, have poor Hebrew grammar. In fact, there is a scathing letter that Maimonides writes to one of his uh, Shlichei Tzibor in his community about how poor the grammar of his PU is. And that's not just because um, we are using these these liturgical poems, but also because there was a time in which the Shaliach Sibor would make up PU team throughout the service. So they would really be feeling themselves and they would come to the Bima and midway between the Amidah, right between, they would just say what was ever what whatever was on their hearts. And sometimes it was really beautiful. And sometimes you knew that it was not going to be so good. And that's where that's where this reshoot and this assurance of I'm not going to be making them up 
Instead, we are going to be relying on the counsel of the wise and of the knowing and the people who uh, understand our tradition. Okay, so that's so that's Misod Hachaim. Can uh, I ask a question? Uh, sure. Okay. So, Alyssa, do you think that that particular paragraph is a little uh, redundant to the psalmist's um, line that we say just before the opening of the Amidah, Adonai Sephatai Tiptah? I mean, I think that it has a lot of the same kind of qualities and even some of the same words. Um, but I imagine that it that it ha that we do it twice, or do or we have a um, we have elements of it repeated, because this is a big deal today. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. We're not just we're not just coming to pray like a normal day. This there's something at stake here, which is what we're going to talk about next. Um, can I have a reader for this Zohreinu? And if you're following along in your Machsor, the Zohreinu is on the top of page 82 in the Lev Shalem Machsor. So in Hebrew, we have Zohreinu lechaim, melech hafetz bachayim, vechatveinu, besefer hachayim, leman ha Elohim chayim. Anybody would like to read in English? Okay, I will read it in English then. Uh, we have, remember us for life, king who desires life and inscribe us in the book of life for your sake, living God. So what jumps out at you first? What literary quality do we have here? Uh, yes, Miranda. Well, we're repeating the word life, Chaim, over and over and over again, what, like five times? In yeah. this one sentence. Yeah, it's it's uh it it really sticks out to you. This is about life. This is about life. Um so we're so we're repeating this, we're repeating this term over or we're repeating this word over and over and over again. Um and that is what this day is about, and we're gonna delve into it in the next verse. So we have Deuteronomy 30, 19 here. And this really shows us that this aspect of life and death and choosing uh, where we can go and how and our and our actions having real divine consequences that are much greater than us has really been in our tradition since biblical times. So. Uh, we read this and it says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. I have put before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life if you and, uh, if you and your offspring would live. So this is Moshe speaking to the Israelites. Um, they're beginning their journey uh, really towards the promised land and he has had it up to here as per usual with them and he pleads with them please please choose life meaning follow god's commandments so that you may continue to live okay Mar 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 marissa do you have a question how do you say your name marissa it's yes thank you it is marissa like vanessa only with an m excellent Thank you. I want to go back, if we might, to um, to the um, remember us for life, King who desires life. Sure. Uh, and I'm curious about what the trans what the real translation is, because the translation, the Safaria says, uh, "For your sake, living God," which would then be talking referring to God, but in the in the book, it says God of life, which would seem to me to be referring to what God is giving to us, rather than the identity of this living God. I'm wondering if that, first of all, does the question make sense to you? And second of all, have you got a, a thought on it? It totally makes sense to me. And I think that that's a 
that's a really interesting question because they really have different connotations. I would say that it is actually the God of life because we because Chaim is not an adjective here. It would it would be like something like uh, Michaim or something like that if we were if we were saying living God or Elohim Chai. Um, it certainly makes more sense given what we're reading about choosing life. Um, if you and your offspring would live, that seems to be an outward look for us rather than the inward look that living God, that living God translation seems to imply to me. So thank you. Yes, I, I would say that, that living God also, um, I'm not sure that that, that that diminishes the connotation of us being reflective and us choosing life and us trying to trying to um, make that happen for ourselves in a in a in a divine way in a div on the divine path. Um, but I would say that it's more that this translation has God much more present in our lives, and certainly in the in the in biblical times. God, we believe God to be present in our lives. Uh, yes, Tony. Oh, we can't. We can't hear you, Tony. Hi. Hello. So, two questions. One is um, in the Zokrenu, where it says, "Inscribe us in the book of life for your sake." Mm. I mean, I can think of a dozen reasons why that would be there but none of them are very satisfactory. I assume it's gotta be a reason I'm not thinking of. And then where in the, um, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day for choosing life. Is that literally life as in your breathing and standing? Or is that life as in you have a good life if you choose the blessing and even though you may still be alive, as in breathing and walking around, if you don't choose a blessing and you choose a curse, you would have a curse of life. Okay. Those two questions. Yes. So, so in the first one, I also was really drawn by this for your sake um, and found a number of different commentaries. I would say that the most compelling one was... Um, if you blot out the Jewish people, God, you will no longer have the same kind of partnership on earth that you have had for this entire, for the entire uh, time the universe has been around. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but it feels very unsatisfactory. Yes, yes. Um, um, I think on some, on some level, it's a little unsatisfactory, but I would say that on another level, you know, that's it's very powerful. It says that we have responsibility here and we're being held accountable and also that we are truly in a partnership with God. It's not one-sided, it's not one-sided. For your second question, um, this is when, when it says, I put before you life and death, blessing and curse, we're talking about um, reward and punishment for following God's commandments or not following God's commandments in uh, in the desert. So that's the kind of life perspective that that's right. About. But when he says life, does he mean, does this mean like it says life and death, blessing and curse. So does curse actually mean dead, like you're underground, like you're dead? Or does it mean you're living a, a cursed life? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that I think that uh, depending on the commentator, you could probably get either of those answers. So, if you're living a cursed life, you've chosen a curse. You might be 20 years old or 15 years old. You've chosen something you don't really know any better. Given tshuva, given Rosh Hashanah every year, you would have an opportunity to change that, right? Totally. To take a blessing in the future. If totally. You've but if it's talking about death, where you're six feet under, you never get that opportunity again. Mm. So you're so you're uh, you're actually punching holes in the whole uh, in the dichotomy of being written in the book of life versus written in the book of death, which we will which we will get to. Now I was just curious because they're two to me they're two very different 
statements. I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. And I yeah. was just wondering what it meant. Okay. I think that I think that it can mean either, honestly. Um, I think that in certain contexts, in the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur context, um, that we'll get into in a second, you have the book of life and the book of death. And it seems like it's really a dichotomy. You're either going to continue to live till the next year or you're not. Um, but at the same time, we do have these words blessing and curse. We do have this concept of scar and onesh, this concept of uh, reward and punishment and accruing that throughout our lives. So I think that uh, I think it, it, it can really go either way, depending on what uh, what text you're bringing it with. Uh, Judy. Yeah, just um, <clears throat> after Marissa spoke, I looked at the text again for Zachreinu, and I thought without punctuation, it could mean different things. But mm. there might be after Elohim, what if there were a comma or a dash? And then it's saying the Sefer Hachayim Laman Cha Elohim Chayim, mm. like to life. I don't know. I mean, it just, I doubt that's what it's intended to be, but I kind of like that read. I like that read too. I don't think that it's intended to be that at all, but uh, but I do really appreciate it. I do really appreciate it. For your sake, God, life, write us for life. Yeah, I like that a lot. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Okay, so we have this dichotomy of life and death and of our actions uh, producing consequences that are not just earthly, but divine. And now we have, even before that, a text that comes right after um, the golden calf incident in Exodus. And God is so, so angry. And Moshe goes up the mountain to chat with God. Uh, and God is like, these Israelites, I'm going to smite them all. Uh, and so and so God says now, oh, no, no, this is this is uh, Moshe. No, this is God. This is God. Now, if you will forgive their sin, well and good, but if not, oh no, this is Moshe. Now, if you forgive their, if you will forgive their sin, well and good, but if not, erase me from the record which you have written. But Adonai said to Moshe, only one who has sinned against me will I erase from my record. Go now, lead the people where I told you, see my, see, uh, see my messenger shall go before you. But when I make an accounting, I will bring them to account for their sins. Okay, so we have a number of references to, the, to this life and death uh, book situation. We have this erasing, erase me from your record of life, presumably. And then we have God saying, look, Moshe, I'm not going to, I won't, uh, I won't um, kill off all of the people right now, but at some point I will bring them to account for their, for their sins. And then we move into the uh, Talmudic passage from where this whole understanding of having a book and about life and a, bo a book of life and a book of death uh, comes from. Uh, yes, Bob and Amy. Thanks. Uh, a, a, sim a simple question before you go to the next paragraph. Sure. The notion of being erased from the book raises for me the question of what how does that connect with our rituals of burial at the loss of somebody, all of which seem to be precisely to cancel any erasure and maintain the memory? Are we maintaining a memory which is no longer maintained by God? What is meant by erasure as opposed to simple death? So here, 
Moshe is saying, erase me from your record, which you have written. And the rabbis say that this record from which uh, God is, is presumably, or from which Moshe is asking God to erase him, is the from the book of life. God vows that God is going to smite all of the Israelites, kill all of the Israelites, i.e. put their names in the book of death. But God is going to keep Moshe and put his name in the book of life. And so uh, Moshe comes up the mountain and says to God, well, if you're, if you're going to kill all of the Israelites, you have to erase my name from the book of life and put it in the book of death too. So that's what's happening here. Um, but regarding but regarding the um, the funereal uh, practices, I would say that we're not that that God is not um, erasing us our like our memories uh, from the earth. Like just as it says that if you are still mentioning someone or still recalling their memory they never they never truly die right so so i so i would not say that that um when god writes our name in the book of death uh we are completely being erased from the earth and shouldn't be memorialized in any way yeah does that answer the question Okay, yeah. Tov. Tov. Let's uh let's go on. All right. Do I have a reader or should I read? Okay. I'll read. Excellent. Okay. Um, we're up to three books. Uh Rabbi Rabbi Cruzpede. Yes. Yes. Rabbi Cruzpede said that Rabbi Yohanan said three books are opened on Rosh Hashanah before God one of holy wicked people and one of holy righteous people and one of middling people whose good and bad deeds are equally balanced. Holy righteous people are immediately written and sealed for life. Holy wicked people are immediately written and sealed for death. And middling people are left with their judgments suspended from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur. Their fate remains undecided. If they merit it, they are written for life. If they do not so merit, they are written for death. Should I continue? You can keep going, yes. Rabbi Avin said, what is the verse that alludes to this? Let them be blotted out of, this, out of the book of the living, but not be written with the righteous, Psalm 69, 29. Let them be blotted out of the book. This is the book of holy, wicked people who are blotted out from the world. Of the living, this is the book of holy righteous people, but not be written with the righteous. This is the book of the middling. Okay, so total shock, first of all, I thought there were only two books, right? We now have this book of middle people. Uh, yes, Sarah. You have to unmute, Sarah. Thank I you. don't. I don't, it doesn't seem to me that anyone is wholly wicked or wholly righteous. That doesn't exist. Right, right. So I'm curious about that. Everyone is middling. Right, right, exactly. So it seems that these three books are opened up and who knows where everyone is put at the very, very end but it does seem like most of them are in the middle until Yom Kippur. And if they merit it, they are written in the book of life. And if not, they're written in the book of death. And we no longer really see the book of the middling anymore. And there was actually a commentary on this that said that the people who are still in the middle uh, are going to Gehenna which I didn't include because I feel like, because I feel like so many of us are in the middle. And, you know, I imagine with, uh, with um, Jewish agita and whatnot, we're all, we're all uh, anxious about whether or not we're gonna end up in that book at the end. 
but it does seem like based on the based on the Talmud here that by Yom Kippur, all of the people who were in this book of the middling, which which uh, there's no reference to uh, anywhere else, at least on Safaria. Um, or in anything that I've learned, but everybody, everybody who's in this book of the middling either ends up in the book of death or in the book of life. Okay. All right, so we are going to move on to our next, uh, our next addition to the Amidah. And if you turn the page, it's on the top of page 83 in your Machsor. Mi chamocha av harachamim zocher yitzurav l'chaim berachamim. So, who is like you, compassionate father, who remembers his creatures for life in his compassion? Lots of gendering here. We don't love that, but we'll we'll uh, we'll live with it. So, this piece. Um, as well as the as well as the Zohrenu piece, uh, were both uh, are both believed to be written at some point in the Gaonic period, which spans from five fifteen uh, to ten thirty eight CE, and could have even possibly be written by one of the Gaonim, the like heads of these giant. Um, we would understand them to be yeshivot in uh, Babylonia. Uh, modern day, not I guess not modern day, but Gaonic time Babylonia post uh, post destruction of the temple. Um, and the first time that they're seen is in the first sea door ever known to us uh, from the 11th century, the sea door of Rav Amram Hagaon. So what's what sticks out to you here that perhaps um, we haven't seen before in the in our editions uh, that's new and what uh, is continuing on. What are new themes? What are themes that we've heard of already? Yeah, Miranda. So in the first edition, it seemed a little more black and white that you're either a tzaddik or a rasha and you have this opportunity during the 10 days of, of tshuva where you can kind of influence your direction but but that's kind of it but here it seems like no hashem also has this compassionate side this merciful side that we can appeal to um where where we can we can be sealed in, in the book of life hopefully exactly yes yeah. so there's so there's this there's this rachamim, there's this open heartedness from Hashem that we have here that, that, um, you know, it, God is not this hard, cold being that's going to look at the going to going to look at the list of deeds that you've that you've done in the last year and say, up, oh, gonna die. God is not like that. God is not like that. Um, and this this piece also also almost tells God um, who God is, who is like you, compassionate father, and then ask, asks God to affirm that, um, that identity. Who is like you, compassionate father? That's telling God who God is, who remembers, you will remember his creatures for life in compassion. We're almost, we're almost, um, um, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's a little too arrogant even, but we're almost trying to tell God, be compassionate. You're compassionate. Please be compassionate. Do this for us. Um, which, which is a, which is a completely different turn from where we were before. Yeah, Raz. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, Rachamim, that I, is that the first time that it's shown up in the readings that we've been doing? And yes. is it the first time? In, it's in the, well, readings? it's the first time in the readings that we that we have. Right. Um, it's not the first time in the Amidah, 
Um, but it's certainly, but it's certainly the first time in which we invoke um, Rachamim when we're talking about life and death. Yes, and so um, we're like com- complimenting God. You know, you're compassionate. You know, also, you know, remember that too. But it's a compliment to God, and even in in other prayers that we have, you know, uh, remember our ancestors. Again, uh, uh, complimenting God, he was so nice to the ancestors, God, she, he, um, you know, you can be nice to us too. So it's, it's that sort of thing, but also it's very beautiful. To, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, very beautiful just to think about God being compassionate, Rachamim, just so wonderful. It's just maybe reassuring to God. It's reassuring to me as well, hearing it. Right, right. I, I'm, and I'm really glad that that um, you said that because this this amida, this praying, this shevach, that that piece of prayer. There are several different pieces of prayer, different categories of prayer, and shevach is one of them. Pray praise of God. Um, yep. And that praise of God does is not meant really to comfort God. It's meant to comfort us, right? Um, so I'm I'm glad that you I'm glad that you said that, uh, Marissa. Thank you, thank you. You know, uh, I always saw this, especially in light of what we've just read. I've always seen this as um, a fearful um, reminder that. God has compassion. Um, I th- I think sometimes when I read this, I'm wondering if the people who are in the old days who were saying this were so frightened by this um, this concept of writing people out of living, blotting people out, um, this aggressiveness that God can have about people who do wrong. Uh, we also hear, um, on the one hand, we're praising God, and on the other hand, we're saying, hey, you know, you could be nice here, too. Um, and so I think that these, particularly as we see, as we see the wandering through the wilderness and the, the mistakes that the people make and the mistakes that the leadership makes, I mean, the golden calf wasn't always and only about about the children of Israel. It also was about the leadership. Um, and I think that this we always have this this balance between what we fear is the capacity of this God and what we want to believe is the compassion that comes with that. That we're part of both, but it's scary, and we mm. never know. Perhaps from one holiday to the next which which we're going to see so that's me being provocative no i'm i'm glad i'm glad that you brought it you're totally you're totally right we're never sure which side we're going to see and certainly in biblical times uh god is portrayed as having many different emotions and perhaps that's just um you know our biblical authors Uh, making God more relatable to human beings. But perhaps, you know, all of these things happened with great wrath. And we're really forced to hold this great love, you know, Ahava Rabbah, and this Afal Paim, this great wrath. Um, Yes, Marjorie. Maybe it's like we're shaping a relationship. We're creating this super ego and we're I mean, uh, uh, apologies to anyone for whom the to whom, for whom this may be um, sound improper, but we're creating a God that will be inspire us to do mm. better, mm. or setting the boundaries of how we want this God like eminence to be so that we can respond in turn. I do really like that that notion of of setting boundaries. We're saying, we're saying, God, you are compassionate. 
you can be compassionate here. I think someone someone else said that too. That's that's uh, that's lovely. Okay, so we're gonna move on to Uvechain. We have these three paragraphs. Um, they are on page eighty-seven in the Machzor. These three Uvechain paragraphs, and we're gonna do a bit of a deep dive um, literarily. So, okay, so I'm gonna need three readers. Who would like to be reader number one in English? Okay, thank you. Reader number two, Roz. Reader number three. Okay, uh, Dad, why don't you start it off? And so. Sure. And so, grant that your awe, Adonai, our God, be upon all your works and your dread upon all you have created. And then all your works will fear you and worship before you will be all your created beings. And may they all form a single band to do your will with a perfect heart. For we know Adonai, our God, that rulership is yours. Strength is in your hand. Might is in your right hand and your name is awesome over all you have created. Okay, so take a minute to let that sit in. And my questions for you are, what are some literary techniques you see the uh, writer of the Piute using? And what are some themes throughout just this paragraph? And while you're thinking about that, I'll let you know that these Uvachim paragraphs, uh, scholars believe them to be from the third century, which is pretty amazing, uh, making them the possibly the earliest poetic addition to the Amidah, which is um, very powerful to think of our ancestors saying these words for so long. Okay. What themes do we see in this paragraph? What literary literary techniques do we see in this paragraph? Uh, yes, Marjorie, go ahead. Um, well, it, again, it's personifying God, but it's also, um in a soft way, commanding God, again, more of shaping that relationship, um, guiding God <laughs> to be more on the Rachamim side, um, mm. <laughs> you know. What, what uh, makes you say that? What makes you say uh, that this is guiding God to be more on the Rachamim side? Well, actually, no, I see, the, there's the fear, there's the fear. Well, um, it's, I mean, there, there is, there is also a sense of, a sense of, uh, you know, God bring all of your, all of your creatures, all of your creations yeah. towards you and towards right. this kind of like relationship. But as you said, continue, there's this it, fear. Right. There's this fear. Line up all your creatures. Look at all the good stuff all these nice little nunnicks you made and may they all form a single band um, to do whatever you want perfectly. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't mean to be irreverent, but- um, Well, I wouldn't say that do whatever you want perfectly, but I would say that there that there is this perfect sense heart. of- Yeah, yeah. This, this sense of perfect heart. I'm not sure if that's- um, if that's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure how snide, how snide uh, that kind of remark is, but at the, and at the same time, I wonder like, is this perfect heart a place of love? Is this single band like a community uh, wide thing? Is this forming a community? Uh, do it loyally and mm. faithful, you know, faithfully. Hmm. You know, if you line them up like good soldiers, then they'll do their thing in the right way fully. 
Because we know God is the ruler and the strength and might. I think that's I think that that's all that's all true, but I also think that um that the unity piece does not have to does not have to be quite a bad thing. Uh Bob and Amy, go ahead. Thank you. I read this as a prayer that we mortal souls have lifted from us the burden of free will. Remove from us the ability to choose. Do it, God, for us, because it's too much for us to have to make a decision. I see this as a very vulnerable and, and um, awestruck prayer, not to know God's will, but to realize our own individual inability to be completely certain. So here is a request that we be freed from the freedom to choose. Mm. I love that. I love that. This ability, this uh, understanding that we don't have control and we can't be fully certain. And yes, uh, Joyce in the chat uh, wrote that it is it, a better translation is really a full heart. Lev Shalem, uh, Belevav Shalem is the is the Hebrew, so a full heart. Uh, yeah, Tony, please. So I'm a little confused. And I must be about the translation. By the way, that was really nice, Bob. Um, the way this is translated in the capitalization, it says, grant that your awe, so that would be Adonai's awe, his awe, um, be upon all of his works. So if I'm reading this properly and you asked about literary devices, that would be, he would be in awe of the works that he created. Not in that phrase that his works are in awe of him. And his dread, your dread, upon all that he has created, right, I think. Um, and then all his works will fear him. So there's some, there's some re reference here to his emotions, God's emotions, um, and God's dread and God's awe, and that he's done this thing of creating us, and then he's like, whoa, what have I done? if this translation is accurate and if the capitalization is accurate. So the capital, I think, I think the translation is um, perhaps taking some liberty, um, but, I, but I understand it to be uh, certainly in the Hebrew and, and actually in the translation too, that, that, um, that it, for it to be like awe of you and fear of you. Grant right. that- Okay, so that's not what the translation- that's not what the first sentence of the translation says. Okay, so I was just wondering from that translation because it, it just says that he's in awe. So I was just wondering then if it was creating a partnership. Um, but if that's not what the Hebrew says, then I'll take my imagination elsewhere. Yeah, I, I guess I don't under I guess I don't understand the grant that your awe Adonai, our God, be upon all of your works to, to say that God is in awe in some way. Uh, perhaps, I think, I think one, one uh, alternative way to understand it would be that, um, would be that, you know, God is uh, completely all of everything and therefore able to uh, give people this or give uh, God's creations this incredible feeling of awe. Perhaps we could perhaps we could translate it that way, but but I really do think that it's uh, that it's uh, giving giving um, awe of God to all of God's creations. So it's the awe that God kind of owns that he's sharing. I, I I think that that's perhaps okay. one way to read it. Yeah, uh, Sonia. Um, well, I, I, I'm I love what 
Bob said, and I'm interested uh, to hear what Tony said, and I'm keeping in mind that you asked about the literary, um, you know, uh, techniques or so I, I, I'll just, I'd like to share my sense of what this means. I, I do feel, you know, it begins with grant that your awe, your, your awe, Adonai, our God, be upon all your works. And, and I do feel that there's something about this prayer that's asking God to be, um, let's say in a sense, proud of all that you've created, you know, uh, uh, in awe um, that your works will fear you and worship before you. And it says will be all your all your created beings. And again, I don't know Hebrew. I'm not sure about the exact translation, but what I see it uh, sort of uh, culminating to is this uh, this um, image. And and may they all form a single band to do your will with a with a perfect heart or a you said a. a, a and I forget what you say, the actual a full heart, a full heart, a, a, a full heart. I mean, full heart, full heart, something like that, that. That's an extraordinary image um, a, a, that all your created beings will form a single band to do. I don't love the idea of the will of God. I never have really, uh, you know, appreciated it or um, so. Uh, but but your will, in a sense, and for and then when then it moves to we know um that the rulership is yours it's in your hand the strength is in your hands something about the right hand which is interesting to me um and your name is awesome over all you have created so awesome is i think something that god i hear it as something that god is experiencing and that we're experiencing as well, it's the emphasis is on the awesomeness and the unity, um, and the desire for that love. And what comes to mind there is a messianic age. That comes to my mind. I have no idea if. Oh, Sonia, we're we're coming to that. Not yet, though. Not yet, though. Um, <laughs> but I'm but I'm really glad that you brought up this theme of unity, wholeness, and also and also this theme of awe because we have that yira and we have that no ra awe and um in, in real real an intensity of awe um yes marjorie go ahead and then we're gonna move on yeah i i had read too fast too fast over the first sentence so if god's awesomeness is is so apparent to everyone all the creatures then they'll have they'll be so uh compelled or to feel like doing good stuff with a complete heart and everyone will know you know that this is the way you know this is every that god is awesome and everything's cool so it's a nicer <laughs> it's totally. less military well, than well, what i, I said that, at first <laughs> i i think that uh you know the the first the first reading you had was i wouldn't say that it was incorrect i would say maybe it was a little pessimistic and this one is a uh is the other side of the coin um but i i appreciate you sharing that one too uh Roz, do you want to share something about this or should we just go to the next one no i'm just ready to read excellent that's what i love to hear okay, okay. and so grant honor adonai to your people, praise to those who fear you, good hope to those who seek you, confident speech to those who yearn for you, joy to your land, gladness to your city, flourishing of pride to David, your servant, and an array of light to the son of Yeshai. Yeshai, thank you you're anointed speedily in our days. Thank you, God. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so what are our themes uh, and literary techniques here? So we have this 
kavod, we have this tikva to tova, we have this ufitchon, we have this simcha, sason, all of these very, very positive um, things coming to the people, right? Coming to your people from God's point of view. Anything else? Yes, Marjorie, go ahead. So here again, it's personifying God, but it's asking God to do stuff to us so that we're better. Um, it's not so much asking God to do something, but... Um, I think it's definitely you know, asking God to, God to do something. Grant all of these good things to your people. Grant honor, but it's asking, well, it's asking God to do stuff. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. But, um, but it's to make us better. Right, right. It is, it is almost as if um, each of these things that we're praying to God for are things that will actually help us do this chuva. Grant honor to your people. Make sure that they actually fear you. The word, the word in Hebrew is yara, so have reverence for you, I would say. And give them hope. These are and confidence. These are all things that that um perhaps people need to really do chuva, to really change. Yes, Bob and Amy. Thank you. As you are talking, I realize that that's just what I see in the first part of this. Mm. But then comes, I, I think I read it to say, in so doing, you will then be able to give us a Messiah. You will then mm. be able to end this time of mortality and having to make choices. You will bring an end of days. Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. That's so, the third so, reading. So Okay, but... But that's different from just give us the ability to be completely honorable. Mm -hmm. that's the, when you do that, you will reveal your next step, which is completely out of our hands to do anything about. Well, I think, I think Bob, you're picking up on something very cool here. The first Uva Chain yep. is really quite universal. We're talking about all of the creatures of the world, all of God's creations. The second Uvechein is talking about um, our people. What what will if if all of the if all of God's creations are able to be filled with God's awesomeness and understands God's ama amazingness um, and God's might, perhaps all of these next things will happen. God will grant our people with uh, honor and. Uh, true yira and yearning and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, uh, Marissa. You know, this is so complicated because I I am reading the the prayer book in front of me while sure. I'm reading the translation from Safaria. And the translation in the prayer book is so much more beautiful than then Safaria, especially this last section where where it talks about David and, and Jesse, it, it says, may the light of David, your servant, dawn, and the lamp of the son of Jesse, your anointed, be kindled speedily in our day. And that's a beautiful, beautiful image, way more beautiful than trying to figure out. It's so direct. It's telling you exactly what it's what it wants there in in such a particularly if you're a grandmother of <laughs> um it and and you have one every people know here that my grandson's about to be bar mitzvah so i oh look my gosh things, also i look for things to say to him and this is this is what i would want somebody to be saying to him much more than the 
the the other uh, the other translation. So I don't want to know which is a better translation. I just want to know that there's sometimes there's such beauty in the poetry that is extraordinary. So thank you, Alyssa, for bringing. My daughter's name is Alyssa. So oh, thank wonderful. you for bringing this to us because it's really very enlightening for what's what's about to come. Thank oh, you. thank you. And I'm glad that you shared the the translation in the Cidor because it is really beautiful. I'll say it that it's a little bit more poetic than the words yeah. on the page, but but uh, but it is extremely beautiful. And that's a big piece of our davening too. Really, uh, really seeing the beauty of the Hebrew translated into our own into our own language or the language that um, we more easily speak. Okay, so we get to the third paragraph. Uvechain, and then, um, I'm sorry, I'm moving my cursor around all the time, I'm trying to get to my notes and this. Um, okay, do we have a third reader? Anybody? Uh, yes, Judy, go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, no, I had to unmute. There we go. Um, and then, the righteous will see this and rejoice, and the upright will be jubilant, and the pious will exult with joyous song, injustice will close its mouth, and all the wickedness will vanish like smoke when you remove the rule of evil from the earth. Okay, so, Bob, here is your um, messianic era right here. We have moved truly from a universal giving everyone uh, Yerat Hashem, um, reverence for God and filling them with God's awesomeness to a honing in on God's people and now to the messianic era. So once again, what would, what, what are themes and uh, literary techniques here? Yeah, Miranda. I'm actually really reminded of the um, the charge in the beginning of Adar to Marbim Besimcha. In each of these paragraphs, we've we've grown in our joy and our celebration. We started with kind of the awe, and and it's actually kind of interesting. It coincides with the universal to the particularist to the messianic era, which I think is perhaps even narrower than the particularist B'nai Israel lens. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Joyce, go ahead. So I think that the last one of the Chayn Sadikim does more of like the, uh, the outcome will be if you've done everything according mm. to plan, so to speak, or what, what the prior paragraphs, then the outcome is going to be that um, uh, bad, uh, you know, evil will be just will be removed from the land. Yes, beautiful, beautiful. So it's really a building up one level after another. Uh, yes, Marjorie. Um, so it's really clear to me, I, I haven't checked the beginning of the translation. I mean, yeah, in the beginning, Sadi Kim are righteous people, but then, you know, and that's just straight prophesizing that mm -hmm. people are gonna do the, gonna get happy um and upright beings will be happy and pious people will be happy but then we start getting personifying abstract concepts like injustice boy i would love to see injustice close its mouth there's just too much loud mouthness of injustice lately That's and the sure. same with wickedness and the rule of evil, those are all concepts of good or bad. And they don't, you know, move, they're being given human-like qualities or act, they're being um, personified. They're being yes. given, yes, animated. They're animated, they're personified and can you hear out zone to that? Um, yes, exactly. Okay, so 
just just to show do a little overview to where we're at right so we've done our avod vimahod we did our little misod paragraph our zohreinu paragraph um givura uh, we have some some uh, PU team that sometimes we do and sometimes we don't de do depending on the leadership. We go into our kadusha, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. We all step on our toes, um, up on our tippy toes, and then we do our uvachain, and then we turn the page again a couple times. Actually, we do our um, some some specific blessings for all holy days, specific texts for all holy days, our Atta Vacharta Mikol Hamim. We do the Eloheinu Veloya Votenu Vimotenu, Ya Leva Ya Vo. Um, we do a few more Eloheinu Veloya Votenu Vimotenus for all holidays. We have our Viteha Zena, we have our Modima Nach Nulach, and we are just about to get to the end, our final two brachot. And right before on page uh, 90, on page 90, that bolded um, line right before the last paragraph, we have a return to a theme that we saw in the beginning, right? We have Uch Tov L'chaim Tovim Kol B'nei Vritecha, and and write for a good life all of the children of your covenant. And then we flip the page. We have our priestly benediction and seem shalom. And then just before we say the final bracha of the Amidah, Oseh HaShalom, we see this last piece. Sefer Chaim Bracha V'Shalom Ufar Nasa Tova, right? V'ni Zacher V'gitni Katev L'fanecha Anachnu in the book of life, blessing, peace, and prosperity, may we and all your people, the house of Israel, be remembered and written before you for a good life and peace. Uh, really, it should be for a life of uh, goodness and peace, probably. Um, so what do we what do we see here? What are some themes that have been carried throughout that we that we saw before? And maybe is there anything that's new here that we haven't seen in prior edition in prior uh, additions to the Amida? Yes, Marjorie, go ahead. Prosperity. Getting wealthy, getting or at least being able to support yourself. Well, I don't know if I I don't know if I would say that there's really a getting wealthy, but certainly uh parnasa is certainly the ability to support oneself. Yes. Uh we have right here if you can see it right here. Ufarnasa Tova. Excellent. Okay, so that's so that's definitely new. That's definitely new. I wonder, there is one word here in this last piece, in the in the Basefer Chaim uh, little chunk there, that is repeated twice that we have not seen for the entire um, for the entire time for all of the texts that we've been studying tonight. One word that's repeated twice there. Shalom. 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 Right. And I think that in one p in one uh, part, it is to talk about to kind of link it in to the bracha shalom at the end, birkat shalom, um, because it really comes right before that. Um, that Osei HaShalom, the last bracha, but also it seems like by the time we get to the end, we really understand what's important. And that's Shalom, that's being able to make a good living, as uh, as Marjorie, you said, that's Parnasa. Um, and I think that we finally understand what's important. I do wonder, why do you think 
you know, we the Amidah on the high holidays is bookended by books, literally. We're talking about Zohreinu, Le Sefer Chaim in the beginning. And then we do all of these things. We talk about all of the all of this these different theologies. We talk about all of these different um, tenets of Judaism. We talk about our yearning, our uh, our praise of God. What will happen if we are able to do all of these commandments and so on and so forth? And then we come back to the Sefer Chaim. What do what do you make of that? Yes, Bob and Amy. I can't be sure, but everything we do is embedded in the presumption that all of the reality we are capable of understanding and all of the reality we know is there but cannot understand or even imagine can be captured in letters, in Hebrew, in books, on script. Mm. I think this in the end is a salute to the Torah, to the idea of Torah. Look at what we do every Shabbos. We, we don't listen to each other explain, we read from a text. And I think that's what this is going back to. This is going back to being a Jew as well as a good person. Mm. So you're saying it's not really about the Sefer Chaim or the Sefer Amate. No, it's the Sefer. It's about, it's about having books and in, in some sense, having education yes. in our lives. Yes. Beautiful, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Dad, go ahead. Maybe related to that in some way. I, I think what it's saying is that at the end of the day, it's all about the story of our lives and the, the life that we lead. Maybe um, uh, giving a little bit of kavod to, to Bob there. Um, maybe the the way in which we live our life. Beautiful, thank you. Yes, and I saw Marjorie, you were nodding your head in a big way, go ahead. Or just to build on all this, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much. No, <laughs> no. Um, when you say, what are the literary devices? I, you know, I groove to that. But um, so what I'm seeing is like these, rabbis or learned Jews who wrote the prayers, who are studying the Torah, they're like using the, as metaphors, mm. writing a, what could be just as good? What's a, the best metaphor of all? It's, it's one that's like the Torah. It's like writing the book of now. The Torah is about those people, our forefathers. Now we're writing the book of the present into the future, into the messianic age. And let's make it a good book. And just for extra measure, because the messianic age isn't coming quite maybe as soon as we'd like. Can I add a little request for a way to make a living so that I can live and be peaceful a little bit until the messiah comes? <laughs> Uh, that's that's a, a very cheeky interpretation uh, at the end there, Marjorie. Um, but yes, yes, I think I think uh, that's that's also a piece. We did we did um, on Rosh Hashanah. It's similar to Shabbat in the fact that we don't ask for things, right? In the same way, um, we don't ask for uh, material things or for healing specifically in the Amidah. Um, but yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. There is that that little teeny ask at the end. Um, I know we're about to run run over, runneth over. But I just want to share um, two uh, of the of the uh, four um, contemporary uh, looks at these texts. Um, Rabbi Laura Geller wrote, "Your book of life doesn't begin today." on Rosh Hashanah. It began when you were born. Some of the chapters were written by other people, your parents, siblings, and teachers. Parts of your book were crafted out of experiences you had because of other people's decisions, where you lived, what school you went to, what your homes were like. 
but the message of Rosh Hashanah, the anniversary of the creation of the world, is that everything can be made new again, that much of your book is written every day by the choices you make. The book is not written and sealed. You get to edit it, decide what parts you want to leave behind. Shana Tova means both good year and a good change. Today, you can change the rest of your life. It's never too late. And I think that that, um, that uh, really, really uh, works in concert with what you were saying, Dad, about, about um, this really being about the story of our lives and what we want to, what we want to make of our lives. And then one last one, we'll end here with uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kligler. He writes, we have, a normal, uh, we have a noble task to perform to expand our senses of the possible. We are to do tshuva and align our beliefs about ourselves with our true and magnificent potential. We are to choose life and aliveness so that, as Moses says, we and our descendants may live long, uh, may live long upon the good earth that the Creator has granted to us. This is the message of the High Holidays. We aim to give up our acquired habit of powerlessness, the idea that we cannot change and trembling at times, crack open the door or the window again to new possibilities and let the breeze rush into our closed room. We aim to open our hearts, even if that means opening ourselves to uncertainty and even pain. Um, and you guys have the source sheet, so feel free to read the other um, the the other passages I pulled uh, on your own time, and I'm happy to continue to discuss. It's been completely wonderful to learn with and from you, and I'm so glad that you all joined me this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Todal you. Rabah. Wow. Total Rabba. Yes. Thank you, Alyssa. Yes, it was great. Bye, boys. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, Latov. Oh. See you all later. Bye, Latov. Sonia Tova.